An election like no other, Donald Trump returns to the White House. Mississippi Congressman returned to Capitol Hill and a runoff election is set for a seat on the state Supreme Court. Russell Tino from Magnolia Tribune joins us to recap a wild week in election news and the federal investigation that could take down the Hines County District Attorney, the Mayor of Jackson, and a city councilman. That and more this Sunday on Mississippi Insight. The Republican Party will soon control the White House and the U.S. Senate. While control of the House remains an open question, it is clear that the nation has leaned toward the right after Tuesday's historic elections. Former President Donald Trump dominated the Electoral College count. Joining us via Zoom is Russ Latino, founder and CEO of MagnoliaTribune.com. Russ, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about the historic election on Tuesday night for Donald Trump. Uh, was that a surprise uh, that he won by such a large margin? I think it was a surprise to most people. Uh, you know, we had been hearing how close the race was. In a lot of ways, the race was still close in those swing states. I mean, you're talking about four and five percentage points separating the two candidates. The surprising part is that former President Donald Trump, now President-elect uh, Trump, uh, you know, won all seven of the swing states. And I don't think that was expected. Uh, he competed very well in states that are historically pretty deep blue. And then he won the popular vote uh, for the first time in 20 years for a Republican presidential candidate to do that, not since George W. Bush had done it. And so all of that creates a sense, I think, in his mind and in his supporters' mind of a potential mandate uh, moving forward into his, into his uh, next presidency. He also uh, knocked Grover Cleveland off. Grover Cleveland was the only president up until now that had ever served non-consecutive terms. Uh, now we've got two guys that will have served non-consecutive terms. And what do you think was the reason that he got that big win? So I think there are a lot of things. I mean, if you looked at Joe Biden's approval rating uh, before he dropped out of the race, his approval rating was tanking. In a lot of ways, I think his vice president and the ultimate uh, Democratic nominee, Kamala Harris, carried with her the perception that the White House had not done enough to address inflation, not done enough to address uh, the immigration crisis at the border, and in some ways had conveyed to the world a degree of weakness that allowed for real foreign conflict to take off. And I think all of those things factored into a sense of dissatisfaction. Exit polls showed that 70% of, of the people leaving the polls said that they thought the correct country was headed in the wrong direction and needed a change. So all of those things benefited uh, Donald Trump. I think the other thing to realize is that 2020 was a bit of an aberration, right? You had COVID, you had all the social unrest. And I think apart from COVID, we're probably talking about the end of Donald Trump's second term. And so in a lot of ways, I think people, some people looked at 2020 and thought, well, this is a signal that the country is moving to the left. In reality, I think it was just we had a once in a hundred year pandemic that had created a lot of uh, a lot of confusion and a lot of dissatisfaction. But the it looks like the trajectory is back towards the right. And I think that's something that political scientists are going to have to grapple with for a little while. President Trump increases numbers in rural areas. He also increases numbers with Hispanic voters and he also did a little bit better in the urban areas. Why do you think those numbers increased? I think for the longest time, the Democratic Party has kind of portrayed itself as the party of the working class. Uh, and for whatever reason, it's gotten away from that. In a lot of ways, it's become more sort of coastal elite, a lot more concerned about what I think a lot of people view as woke issues uh, versus sort of bread and butter around the kitchen table issues. And to Donald Trump's credit, he figured out a way to communicate to working class folks so that you have this, this huge uptick in Latino vote uh, for Trump this election, 45%, which was a plurality, I think, of, of the Latino vote. And then you look at even, you know, amongst black males, uh, he got 20% of black males, which is the highest, I think, that's occurred in the last 60 years in this country for a Republican candidate. So so Trump was able to sort of break that, that wall, if you will, the Democrats have, have historically had around working class citizens. And I think his message resonated, and we saw that, you know, reflected in the polls in a way that broke through some of the demographics uh, and how they normally align. It, it looks like when they're looking, doing the autopsy right now with the Democratic Party, it looks like that the Democrats are receiving uh, the educated voters. Uh, Republicans tend to see the, as you mentioned, the working class or the non-educated voters, but there's a big gap in that disparity. Why are we seeing that gap? Yeah, I think to, to a certain degree that's true. I mean, some of that probably has to do with uh, where people who matriculate through college end up living for work 
uh, you know, a lot of the political divide in this country really is more urban versus rural. Um, and so I think sometimes there's overlap that people may confuse between, you know, sort of educated versus uneducated populations. I think to some degree, too, though, that there are populations that may not be formally educated that are kind of tired of being talked down to and treated like they're dumb. And I think some of that occurred in this election cycle where you kind of got tired of people being told that they were wrong. You got tired of people being told that they were fascist or Nazis or whatever extreme thing could be thrown at them. And at some point, it was like the boy who cried wolf. They just started ignoring it. And if anything, built up a resistance to it. I will say, though, the, the idea of, of Harris's performance amongst women and amongst college-educated whites, which were the two areas uh, that I think the Harris campaign thought that they were going to be able to eat into, the numbers actually don't reflect that she had much gains in either of those areas. In fact, she performed more poorly with women uh, than Joe Biden had in 2020 and more poorly with women than Hillary Clinton had in 2016. So I think if you were a Democratic operative, you were going into the election cycle thinking, Abortion's a major issue. We're going to be able to push that and get up the women vote, you know, in a significant way to counterbalance Donald Trump's success amongst men. And the numbers just don't reflect that that happened. Seven states have passed those uh, abortion rights or ballot initiatives on, on dealing with abortion. Uh, what do you see happening uh, now that Trump's going to be back in office when it comes to those issues uh, uh, dealing with abortion rights? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, taking him at his word, he has said he's not interested in a national abortion ban. I think he signaled throughout the campaign that he personally is maybe more open to, to there being access to abortion through a certain point in pregnancy. Obviously, his wife came out very shortly before the election, Melania Trump, and, and wrote a book, and basically in that book made the case that she's for unfettered right to, to access to abortion. And so all of those signals suggest to me that I don't think you're going to see some sort of national policy on abortion coming down the pipe. And at some level, that's what conservatives have always argued, is that really this decision should be made at the state level where voters get to elect their representatives and those representatives get to make decisions aligned with voters' values in their states. And you see that happening, whether you see ballot measures passing to protect abortion, you see some ballot measures or, or statutes going into effect uh, to restrict abortion, and that's a byproduct of, of democracy in those states. Uh, let's take a look at Congress right now. The Republicans uh, have taken control of the Senate. It's still up in the air about uh, what's going to happen in the House. How do you see this balance of power and what's going to happen? Uh, what do you think is happening now? Yeah, so the, the Senate, for if, if you're a Republican or if you support Donald Trump, uh, the Senate victory is almost as big of a deal as, as the presidency uh, because I think the anticipation was that you would end up with 51 Senate seats, which is a majority. Uh, but it's not a majority that leaves a lot of room for error. Uh, wh where they ended up is at 53 Senate seats, and there's still a couple that are kind of up in the air, but I think they'll end up with 53. That gives you a little bit more room if you've got a member that can't take a tough vote because it's not sort of what's in line with their state. Um, and certainly that puts Donald Trump in a much better position in trying to get legislation passed. Of course, the interesting thing to see is gonna be what happens in the House. And I think that's, that's anybody's guess at this point. It's very tight. And, you know, I kind of think I said this with you election night. Um, if you look at it, the House is always slower than everybody else. You're dealing with 435 seats. Some of those seats are in state that count ballots very slow, like California. And so it's just going to take some time to know. Uh, if I had a wager, I'd say Republicans will end up with a marginal uh, majority. But, you know, that's not necessarily the kind of thing that makes it easy to get legislation passed, particularly if you've got coalitions within that majority that have very different views of, of what the party should be doing. And that's what's happened to Kevin McCarthy when he was the speaker. That's what's been happening to Mike Johnson, even though they've got majorities. There's a contingency within that Republican caucus uh, that wants to behave in a way that a lot of people, I think, would characterize as more extreme. If Republicans have a sweep and have control of, of Congress and the White House, what do you see happening uh, within the first year of President Trump's presidency? So I think there's some big things that have to be done uh, relatively quickly. Uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that was passed in 2017, uh, which doubled the standard deduction for most pa families, um, gave tax cuts up and down the board for every marginal tax rate uh, in our tax system. Uh, that's due to expire uh, at the end of this year. And so I, I suspect one of the first orders of action would be trying to, to uh, reauthorize that so we don't end up with de facto tax increases on people. I think there are big questions about what it looks like for America to be engaged in foreign policy moving forward. 
Uh, you know, does our posture towards the Ukrainian-Russia conflict change? Does our posture with Israel change? And, and then obviously, I think the immigration question is going to be a big one. I suspect what you'll see is a reversion to some of the Trump policies, uh, like reinforcement of Remain in Mexico, some of those types of policies really aimed at vetting. Um, and, and then, you know, new issues, uh, certainly I think there'll be debate on whether or not to use tariffs. Uh, tariffs, that, particularly high tariffs, end up being taxes on, on U.S. consumers. Uh, and so I think you're going to see, now that we're past election and messaging season, you're probably going to see some healthy debate within the Republican Party over whether or not some of those ideas around huge tariffs are actually good for the economy. I have more with Russell Tino after this break. We'll be right back. And welcome back. You, this week, uh, three more leaders in the city of Jackson have been indicted for bribery charges. We're talking about the Hines County DA, the mayor of Jackson, and the city council member, Aaron Banks. Uh, uh, Russ, what do you make of these indictments that came down this week? I think it's a long time coming. You know, you look back in May uh, and the raids that happened on the Hines County District Attorney's office and, and some of his business interests as well. Uh, you know, at the time, the FBI also went to City Hall and then had some conversations about talking to the mayor and, and uh, then president of the city council, Aaron Banks. And so there was a lot of smoke already around all three of these individuals, particularly as some of the other smaller players have pled guilty in the, over the last couple of months. When you look at those bills of information that prosecutors put out, it was pretty easy to start to guess who the, who the co-conspirators were based on descriptions of what they had done. Um, so it's not surprising, it's very disappointing you know, for the people of Jackson who obviously deserve good leadership. They deserve to know that their district attorney is working uh, as a, a person who is pursuing uh, the law and pursuing the enforcement of the law and not breaking it. Uh, and certainly deserve to know that their, their mayor, the, the titular leader of the entire city, is doing the same thing. I think the indictments are, are damning, Byron. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting, I practice law for a decade, I've talked to several prosecutor friends. This is a very strange indictment that was released this week and that normally it's very bare bones. It doesn't give you all this detail. Um, I think the U.S. Attorney's Office, Todd G., who was appointed by uh, President Joe Biden, who got a start in Vinnie Thompson's office, is responsible for this prosecution. If you look at what they did, they put incredible detail up to and including pictures of some of the acts that are alleged involving both uh, Mayor Lumumba and DA um, Jody Owens. And so I, in a lot of ways, it was shocking to see how much detail they put in. And then you look at the details themselves and it reads like something out of Donnie Brasco. Both, all three of men say that they are gonna fight the indictments. They pleaded not guilty this week. Uh, this week. And so what do you see happening in this fight for these indictments? Because when the federal government indicts, usually they feel like they have a strong case. Yeah, you know, I think the federal government typically operates differently than when you, what you would think about it in a state court. They, they are very meticulous. They go after you. They've got an over 90% success rate. And in this case, they've got ample amounts of recordings, video recordings, audio recordings, based on the indictment of people making what are very damning admissions. You've got an instance on a yacht outside of Fort Lauderdale with the mayor and the district attorney with these FBI operatives in which the mayor was handed an envelope with $50,000 worth of checks and asked to make a phone call to change an RFQ date, essentially to eliminate competitors on this fictitious hotel project that the FBI had set up. And so those sorts of facts, you look at Owens, you know, received $115,000 in cash. There are pictures of the indictment of him holding a stack of cash on the yacht. Um, and then you've got these salacious uh, bits about going to a gentleman's club and all those sorts of things that add up. Um, I think that it's gonna be really hard uh, for them to fight and win this. That's not to say never, because things happen. Sometimes juries decide, despite facts, that they, they're just gonna overlook things. But I will tell you that given the facts that are out there, it's incredibly difficult. And then given the amount of, of penalty that is hanging over their heads, you know, if you're, if you're Jody Owens, uh, my recollection is that the penalty is something like potentially up to 90 years and $2 million. 
Uh, if you're Chakwe Lamamba, the penalty is, I think, 70 years and a $1.5 million that's hanging over his head. Those sorts of numbers and the facts that are out there typically yield at some point a guilty plea. Uh, we'll see if that happens or whether or not they continue to fight. What do you expect? They're back in court in January. What do you expect to see when they go back to court in January? Uh, my, my anticipation, given the facts, is that they're going to have to try and present some sort of entrapment defense. Um, that essentially that they, they, they didn't act of their own volition. Entrapment defenses are exceedingly rare. Like a lot of people think, well, entrapment is when somebody doesn't tell you that they're an FBI agent. Um, and that's not true. You essentially have to prove that you fought the coercion of the FBI and they were relentless almost to the point of forcing you to do something illegal. And if you read the indictment allegations and assuming that the prosecution can prove this to be true, the essence of it is that Owens actually brought to the FBI operatives the RFQ opportunity that he proposed to them how the bribes would be done, the mechanisms, the campaign contributions to do the bribes, and at some level that he was the one that went out and brought Mary Lumumba into the fold. Um, in fact, there's a conversation recorded in the indictment where the FBI operatives asked uh, Owens, do we even need to get Lumumba involved in this? And Owen said, yeah, I think so. He could make it difficult if we don't. Um, and so proving that the FBI forced them to do illegal activities um, is going to be a very difficult scenario based on currently available information, based on what's already in the, the indictment. Um, so we'll see how it unfolds. Uh, but, but I will tell you, I think there are a lot of people, the prosecutors that I've talked to, that looked at that and said, the U.S. Attorney's Office has built a case here that is going to be hard to beat. Russell Tino, always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Byron. All right, and we'll be right back. Economic matters were a key concern for voters in the 2024 presidential campaign. We hear plenty of reports suggesting that the nation's economy is strong, but that strength isn't well appreciated at the consumer level after many months of inflationary trends. Thursday, the Federal Reserve cut its benchmark interest rate by a quarter point. We talked with state economist Corey Miller about that. This cut of 25 basis points now was kind of widely expected. Uh, unlike the uh, 50 basis point cut we got in September, which uh, I think surprised a lot of uh, folks. They weren't expecting that much of a cut. Um, but I think going back to the September cut, the Fed uh, made that choice because they were concerned about the weakening of the labor market and they wanted to uh, bring interest rates down more quickly. Since that time, we've had some more uh, upbeat, more encouraging economic data. Um, and it, most analysts seem to think they can probably slow the pace of, of rates uh, now un unless you know we get some, some changes from that date. This 25 basis point cut that we got today, I think was pretty much uh, you know baked in for several weeks, uh, regardless of how the election came out. Uh, I think 25 basis points uh, was what most people were were expecting and what they got today say it's probably a good sign on inflation because um you know that they, they wouldn't be cutting if they were concerned inflation was you know gonna um surge up again right right now so it's a good sign from that um uh, but at the same time you know it's, it's just 125 basis point cut in part of a long process you look at what's happened since the, the, the 50 basis point cut we got in september uh mortgage rates and others have not come down they've actually come up um, and I think that is based on uh, just some concerns that the economy is 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 doing better than than you know markets think. Maybe we don't get as many rate cuts as as quickly as uh, we were thinking just just a few weeks ago. And and there's also you know some in, some concern about uh, uh, an increase uh, in economic activity. What that can mean for inflation, you know, uh, could, could we uh, see rates going a little higher for a little longer? Uh, but it's 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 like I say, it's part of a process. And as long as the Fed is convinced that inflation is not going to, uh, you know, shoot back up, uh, I think they're going to continue a slow, steady pace of rates. 
uh, before uh, earlier earlier this year, the Fed was it primarily had been concerned and almost exclusively concerned with inflation. And but since earlier this year, they're almost equally concerned about the labor market now. Um, and as, as long as it looks like the labor market is not um, deteriorating very rapidly, I think they can continue with the quarter uh, point um, cuts for the over the next year. Big thanks to Magnolia Tribune's Russell Tito for joining us this week. We'll be back next weekend with more of the political and current affairs coverage that you demand. I'm Byron Brown from all of us here at 12 News. Make it a great weekend.